disciples. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wild flowers grow. They do not labour or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendour was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? Do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. The pagan world runs after all such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock. Your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Keep that page open in your Bible. Um, it was page 1045, um, the one that, uh, the passage that Peter read so wonderfully to us. I want to record Peter reading that and just play it to myself every evening to help me not worry. It was so wonderfully read. Thank you, Peter. Um, uh, so Luke 12, uh, verse 22 to 34, there's a moment in the Sherlock TV show, um, if you ever saw it, where Sherlock Holmes is trying to find a lady's hidden safe, um, but she's very clever, she's giving nothing away, and even Sherlock, with his analytical brain, he can't figure out where she's hidden this safe. So he gets uh, John Watson, his, it is John Watson, isn't it? Watson, to um, secretly set off his, the smoke alarm in the corridor, and in that brief second where the alarm goes off, Sherlock watches her eyes. And they just flicker, just for a moment, uh, to the corner of the room towards where her safe is hidden. And so Sherlock finds out where the safe is and he gets what he needs out of it. And he explains to her, he says, on hearing a smoke alarm, a mother would look towards her child. Amazing how fire exposes our priorities. And you might have been asked that kind of icebreakery question. If there was a fire in your house and you could only grab one thing, what would you take with you? Um, and maybe you could change it. Maybe you could say, and it's not allowed to be a family member. They get out and it's not allowed to be a pet. What one thing would you take with you? Um, now, as someone who collects comics and action figures, I hate that question. Um, it actually makes me kind of anxious because I know that I wouldn't be able to take them all and I wouldn't be able to choose just one of them. Um, but I sometimes think about grabbing a big, one of those big starfish boxes out there and having them at home just in case I just sort of put them all in and run out. Um, uh, but it is a question that exposes our priorities. It's a question that exposes what our hearts are set on. And today Jesus wants us, uh, wants us to think about what our hearts are set on. Because there's many things that we could set our hearts on that will make us worried and anxious. And there are other things that we could set our hearts on that would free us of worry and anxiety. So firstly today, Jesus says, do not set your hearts on the worries of today's world. Do not set your hearts on the worries of today's world. Now the chances are you are worried about something this morning because we worry all the time. So just this week, just in this one week, I've been worried about my work, airport security, my weight, my family being late, what other people, uh, sorry, my family being late, what other people think of me when I do this or say that or I'm quiet, um, my ankle, which is re recovering a little bit slowly for my liking, um, I've been worried if I'm eating too much, and I had pizza yesterday, that didn't help, and I've been budgeting to see if I have enough money to make it through till when I get paid, I'm also worried about what I might not be able to buy, and um, because I'm trying to live um, sensibly, um, I'm worried about what I'm wearing, um, 
the pink. Um, is it appropriate? Does it look good? Does it fit properly? At one point this week, I had a strange cat sit right on my lap, and I was worried it was going to pop its claws like Shere Khan. Um, I've worried about germs. I've worried about the hot weather. I'm worried about um, impressing other people. I'm worried about not having time to myself and time with Annika. I've worried quite a lot this week. I'm worried now because I've got my nerves on the floor. <laughs> um, and there's lots of people out there who, who want you to be worried. I took an advertising module at university, and that's pretty much what we were told to do. Um, create worry and exploit anxiety in order to sell stuff. Um, so if you go on YouTube, you get those little five seconds. You've got five seconds, and then you're allowed to skip them. And in those five seconds, they tell you, do worry. Do worry about the economy so that you invest in gold. Or worry about your health and buy this weird powdered meal drink thing. And worry about your image and buy a gym membership. Worry about your relationships and pay for this dating app. And I feel really sorry uh, for the current generations growing up because all they've ever known is a world where every single bad thing that happens the world over is glaring, in the, glaring them in the face 24-7 on, on social media and on, and on the news. You know, once upon a time, there was only so much, as much news as could fit in the pages of a newspaper um, or the 30-minute slot that it had on the television, but not anymore. Now we're refreshing for updates on the cost of living crisis, the Ukraine war, COVID, terror attacks, knife attacks, gunmen, um, councils not giving enough school places to people in the village, corrupt police officers and politicians, refugee crises. Um, that's the world out there. And on top of that, uh, youngsters these days are worried about exams and, and bullies and making friends, all those kind of normal worries that they might have. So the world very much says, do worry, do be worried. But Jesus, in verse 22, have a look at what he says. He says, do not worry. Do not worry about your life. Or do not set your hearts on the worries of today. Um, I remember a moment in a TV show. Um, you have one friend, Mark. He's trying to console the other friend, Jeremy. Um, and Jeremy's feeling scared. And Mark says, look, don't be scared. And Jeremy says, well, I am scared. Um, Mark, he's English, um, so he doesn't really know what to say. He just repeats himself, don't be scared. Um, and Jeremy says, well, well, I am scared. And Mark goes, that's okay. It's perfectly normal to be scared. Um, and when you're scared or anxious or worried, having Jesus tell you, don't worry, it doesn't doesn't always feel like it will help but Jesus has more to say to you than an awkward English person who who asked how you were and now they're regretting it because you didn't just say oh fine thanks you said more and um, Jesus has so much more helpful and, and I think practical things that we can do as well and so firstly Jesus suggests bird watching and um, when you're worried look at the birds do you see that in verse 24 he says, consider the ravens. Now, I'm not sure where to find ravens near us, um, but they're quite similar to jackdaws, and we do have a family of jackdaws living at Christchurch Redbourne. I'm going to go quiet, and we'll see if we can hear them, because you often do. No. Well, they're not at work. I know they're not at work. I'll tell you why. Um, jackdaws, uh, if you have a look out in the church garden next time you're in the kitchen or the office, you'll probably see them. They're black with a gray head and very blue eyes. Um, you might hear them making their noise, which sounds like jack, jack. So have a listen. Um, next time you're watching them from church, look at how they walk around in the grass. Um, they're finding things to eat. You'll see them find things to eat and they'll eat them. Um, uh, or in the church office, if you watch them, they'll land on the gutters, especially after it's been raining, and they'll drink. I don't know why there's so much water in the church drain pipes are supposed to probably drain out but there's enough water for them to, to drink there and um, and what does Jesus say in verse 24 about the Christchurch jackdaws um, they do not sow or reap they have no storeroom or barn they're not investing in cryptocurrency or rifling through nectar vouchers at Sainsbury's for the best deals um, not that any of that is wrong 
But those birds are certainly not worrying about any of those things. And God feeds them. And Jesus says, how much more valuable you are than birds. And that's true. You are far more valuable than a bird. Um, as smart as they look, there is no jackdaw that can say that they are made in the image of God. But everyone here can say that. There's no raven that could, be, that could claim to be the pinnacle of God's creation. There's no bird that could point to a time in history where the God of all things was incarnated and took on bird flesh. But every single human in this room can say those things. There's no bird in the world that could say that they have been bought and paid for by Christ. But every Christian in this room can say that. And if you're not yet a Christian, that price has still been paid for you to give you the opportunity to trust in Jesus. There's no jackdaw or raven that can say that. Every single person in this room is far more valuable to God than any bird is. So next time you're anxious, try some bird watching. And, um, but remember those things. As you're watching the birds, remember um, how valuable you are to God. You could also try gardening. Look at verse 27. Jesus says, look at how the wildflowers grow. They do not labor or spin. And I'll back Jesus up here. Um, the dandelions in my garden do not labor or spin. In fact, I do everything I can to prevent them growing, and yet they still grow. Actually, Annika and I have done a little experiment in our front garden. And um, ever, uh, ever since I got the house, the front garden is just a bunch of gravel, um, with this kind of tattered black netting underneath it. Um, and this year, I think maybe even last year, we decided to just let it grow um, and see what happens. Um, it's amazing. I've never once planted a single thing or watered uh, the, uh, the, the, the plants or fed the soil in any kind of way. I've not done anything. Um, and yet our garden, our front garden, has purple flowers, yellow flowers, some feathery-looking grass, um, some plants with red leaves, um, some orange and yellow poppy looking flowers um, we even had a bramble come up uh, which I did pull up but um, I could have had free berries from that um, for, for doing no work that's wild flowers for you in the meantime our back garden we're not getting any flowers <laughs> the ones that we're trying hard on verse 27 that's wild flowers they do not labor or spin Yet I tell you, not even Solomon, he was the richest king in the history of Israel, not even him, in all of his splendor, the splendor that impressed the queen of Sheba when she came to visit, not even him, in all of his splendor, was dressed like one of these. And verse 28, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, how much more will he clothe you? Plants are perishable, they grow and they live and they die. They come and go. Do not make the mistake of thinking that we are the same as human beings. C.S. Lewis said, you have never talked to a mere mortal because all of us were created as immortal beings. We were designed to live with God in his kingdom for eternity, forever. And sin has frustrated that. The same sin that gives us bad news to worry about has frustrated our bodies so that they do die. But we are not perishable plants. Scientists have found a plant. Um, they call it the resurrection plant. It can survive extreme dehydration for months and even years. But there has never been a plant that has died and three days later, risen again. But the man Jesus did. And when the physical Jesus ascended to heaven, he did not go to prepare a flower bed for perishable plants, but he went to prepare a place for imperishable people. And the Bible says that every single person in this room will be raised bodily in the future because we're more important than plants Every single person in this room will appear before God and will have to answer for the ways that we've lived our lives. 
There's no plant that will have to face Jesus as judge. There's no plant that will have to be punished for their sin because what plants do doesn't matter. And there's no plant that will be saved for eternity by the blood, or I suppose the chlorophyll, of some kind of plant Jesus. There's no such thing because plants are just not as important as you and I to God. So when you're next anxious, watch the birds, tend the garden, and remember those things. Now some might read this passage and think that it's promising that Christians are always going to be flush with cash, they'll never be hungry, they'll, never, they'll always have nice clothes to wear. And that's not actually what Jesus is saying. Um, it's not, he, he's also not saying that people are, who are poor are in some way lacking faith or in some way less valuable to God. He's also not saying that you should give up working or providing for your family. Those are the kind of things you might hear from prosperity gospel preachers, but it's, it's nonsense. Um, it doesn't chime with the rest of the Bible. It doesn't chime with Jesus' own life and his experience. It doesn't even really make sense within its own context. So Jesus can't be blanket promising that God will provide every single thing you think you might need because in verse 33, Jesus recognizes there still will be poor people. Rather, what Jesus is saying is that God is good and he knows our true needs and if God in his goodness can be trusted to look after the birds and the plants, how much more can he be trusted by us to fulfill the true needs of the creatures he loves most of all? Someone else suggested a third thing that you can try when you're anxious. In verse 25, Jesus says, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Apparently the expression that Jesus used was who can add a single cubit to your height? or a single inch to your height. Um, And it's funny, isn't it? Growing is quite, I don't mean to show off, but growing's pretty easy. Um, And when I was younger, I was great at growing. I grew loads when I was little. Um, Even Sophie, um, she's only just gone one years old. She can't really talk yet. She can't really walk yet, but she's really good at growing, I've noticed. Um, Congratulations, Shark. Um, Growing is easy. It's an easy thing to accomplish, but... When I stand next to Annika, and she's got even a slight heel on her shoes, and I'm kind of wishing I could grow a bit, I can't do it. I can't make myself grow. Who of you, by worrying, can grow an extra inch? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? If anything, worrying will take the hours off. Verse 26, since you cannot do this very little thing, Why do you worry about the rest? There's three things you can try next time you're anxious. Um, You could try some bird watching or try some gardening or try some growing. As you're doing those things, remember who you are to God. God knows you. He values you. He loves you. He made you. He grew you. He is good and he knows your true needs. He is absolutely worthy of your trust, even in the most difficult times, and especially when you have lots to worry about. Remember those things and do not worry about the worries of this world. And also remember that Jesus doesn't say this to condemn you. He didn't say this so that you would feel guilty for being worried. He didn't say it so that you would stop taking medication to help with anxiety. For some people, medication can be really helpful and a good thing. Jesus says this because he cares. In 1 Peter 5 verse 7, one of Jesus' best friends who knew him really well, he tells us, cast your burdens, cast your worries, put them onto Jesus because he cares for you. More than birds, more than flowers. Jesus cares for you and he wants you to live without worry because he knows that our Heavenly Father is good and is worthy of our trust. Which is why when we're worried, the best thing we can do is to pray. We can talk to our Heavenly Father about our worries. He cares for you. He is good. 
He knows what you truly need and he is worthy of our trust. So do not worry. Do not set your hearts on the worries of today's world. Um, And secondly, instead, set your hearts on the eternal kingdom of God. Set your hearts on the eternal kingdom of God. In the um, Pirates of the Caribbean movies, uh, Captain Jack Sparrow, he's got a special compass that always points towards whatever the owner most wants in that moment. So it points to your greatest heart's desire. And whenever Jesus speaks about your heart, um, that is what your heart does. It orients itself towards what you most want in the moment. It's in verse 34. Have a look. Verse 34. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Wherever the thing you want most is, your heart will be pointing towards it. And Jesus wants us to calibrate our hearts so that the needles point towards something eternal. That's verse 31. Seek God's kingdom. Set your hearts on God's eternal forever kingdom. And that's the fundamental difference between someone who trusts in Jesus and someone who doesn't. Verse 30, the pagan world runs after all such things. Our hearts are by nature oriented away from God. They point us towards food and drink um, uh, and clothes and our body and the immediate nearby worries of the day. Look at what it says. The pagan world runs after such things. They are are in a panic. And, And to an atheist, there's no eternity so only matter matters and if only matter matters then your anxiety will increase exponentially and if you want proof of that just look at the culture today as a culture we've largely rejected god we've rejected the idea of there being an eternity and as a consequence we're seeing the rates of anxiety skyrocket rates we've never seen before Our heart compasses, they ping all over the place. And we run after wherever they point, trying to soothe our anxieties, but but only making it worse. So the pagan world is in a panic. And I need to say at this point too, if you're not yet a Christian, if you're not yet trusting in Jesus, well, you're still an eternal being. You're not a perishable plant. But when you are raised from the dead and you face the judgment of Jesus, if you have not trusted in him, then I have to say you should be worried now. Because an eternity, when you are stuck, body and soul, in the anguish that comes from being in broken, frustrated separation from the one who made you, that is something to be worried about. It's something that you need to do something about. But the good news is that you are literally one prayer away from being saved from that kind of eternity and saved from that kind of worry. Because for those who trust in Jesus, for those who follow him, his disciples, as Jesus calls them, Jesus says, we have nothing to fear. Do you see in verse 32? Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. One prayer and your eternity can be changed from one of separation and anguish to one in God's kingdom. For the Christian, that is the eternity we have now. God has given it to us through Jesus already. We truly have all we need in Christ. And so we are free to sell our possessions and to give money to the poor because we don't have any eternal need for it. And Jesus isn't saying that you've got to sell everything right now and give it all away. God does bless us with money and things and work and families to provide for. And and we can enjoy our life in his creation as part of our worship in him. But we do need to keep all of those things in an eternal perspective. And that will mean we can also give happily to the poor or use things hospitably in service to God. Whenever I do hear people talk about cryptocurrency, I don't really understand cryptocurrency, but when I hear people talk about it, it's either people saying, um, 
Well, it's very silly, isn't it, cryptocurrency? Money is much more reliable. Um, or it's about, oh, cryptocurrency is great because the economy is not, not very reliable. Um, but without an eternal perspective, both of those things are going to look like a silly investment. Just like last week, we, we looked at the rich man, the rich fool in the parable. He invested without one thought towards the eternal kingdom of God, and it was a stupid investment. Jesus wants us to invest in something eternal. Look at verse 33. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail when no thief comes near and no moth destroys. Jesus says, if you're investing, we'll make sure you diversify your assets. Don't only invest in perishable things. Make sure you're investing primarily in something eternal, in the kingdom of God. And what we have in, uh, in Jesus is eternal. It's imperishable. It cannot be eaten. It cannot be frayed. It cannot be lost or stolen or taken away by the repo men. Jesus says, calibrate your hearts to that. Set your hearts there. You know, the same way when you're fed up at home, uh, uh, sorry, at work or at school, and you're dreaming of home, you've set your hearts on being back at home. Jesus says, set your hearts on God's kingdom. In the film um, Mulan, when you first meet Mushu the dragon in the, in the animated one, um, you see his ginormous shadow on the wall and you hear his cacophonous voice booming. But when Mushu steps out, he's, he's tiny and Mulan says, oh, it's just a little lizard. Um, so he has a big shadow, but actually he's very small. And uh, as the saying goes, worry gives small things a big shadow. Our hearts see these big shadows and the needle compass starts to spin in panic and anxiety. But Jesus says, stop, stop. Look at what you have. If you trust in me, you, you worry about things that you might not have, but what you have is far bigger. You have a heavenly father. He made you. He grew you. He came down and experienced every kind of thing that you might worry about. He is good and he knows your true needs. He loves you. He bought you at the price of his own blood and he has prepared a place for you. He has given you the kingdom and it cannot be taken away. So let us set our hearts at this morning and this week on the eternal kingdom of God and give the rest of our worries to Jesus. Let's pray now. Father, we thank you for the things that you have given us. We thank you for how you have provided um, daily things, um, like food to eat and clothes to wear. We thank you for your generous um, and graceful uh, character, God. Um, but Lord, we pray for those eternal things that you have given us that cannot be uh, stolen or eroded away. Thank you for the security we have when we trust in Jesus. And Lord, we pray that you will help us to remember that. Help us to remember who you are, that you are good, that you know our true needs, and you are absolutely worthy of our trust. And so, Father, we pray that tomorrow, um, once the week starts and our worries come trickling in, we pray that we will remember those things. And if birds help remind us of that, if gardening helps remind us of that, if growing helps remind us of that, we pray that you will use those things to remind us of your character this week. Amen.